Allison Aguilar, and I want to thank you for joining us uh, for the program live from the library presented by the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. I'd like to, we'd like to thank our sponsors for the live program, the Friends of the Walnut Creek Library, the East Bay Times, and the Minuteman Press Lafayette. Tonight we have a local Bay Area author, Gregory Crouch, and he's going to discuss his new book, The Bonanza King, John Mackey and the Battle Over the Greatest Riches in the American West. Greg has authored four previous books, including China's Wings and Enduring Patagonia, and published many more stories in national and regional media. He is also a member of the National Book Critics Circle and a regular book critic, reviewing books in places such as the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the New York Times Book Journal. Greg graduated from West Point. He served in the Army. I'm an Air Force brat, so I just thought I'd tell you that. And he continues to pursue his love of adventure travel, rock and ice climbing, and international mountaineering. The Bonanza King is available for sale, and Greg will be signing books after the program. Please welcome Gregory Crouch. Thank you very much, Allison. All right, well, thanks very much for coming out. Um, Described as a Bay Area author, I should more accurately be described as a Walnut Creek author. I, I live about uh, a mile and a half from here, or two miles from here, right over uh, by Lark between Larky Park and Lunardi's. And, and I will, re on very hot days, because we don't have air conditioning, I will regularly be found downstairs stealing the Walnut Creek Library's air conditioning uh, <laughs> while I try and get some work done. Um, so thanks very much for coming, and thank you to the Walnut Creek Library for bringing me out and for turning out such a good crowd. Um, so we're here to talk about my book, The Bonanza King. I actually left my copies at home, and they don't seem to have arrived yet. So there is uh, just proof that this thing exists. You can pass around the postcard and look at the cover. Um, so we're, uh, John Mackey uh, is the seminal figure in the history of the Comstock. Well, there is a copy, so we do have actual proof that it exists, fabulous. Um, sometimes it can seem dubious, um, like maybe somebody else told that story. Uh, the, um, um, the Comstock load was the Silicon Valley of the 1860s and 1870s. If we, uh, it's the perfect analogy. It drove immense stock market booms and busts in mining shares. It created San Francisco. It turned San Francisco from the trading port that was serving the mining camps of the gold rush into the innovative financial powerhouse that it is today, still is today. And um, many of the parallels in this story you can see in your own lives. All of us have lived through the first tech boom, for example. That would be just like the first Comstock boom in the early 18, 1860s. And then 15 years later, there was an even bigger boom uh, in the middle 1870s, which is fairly analogous to how the tech industry is going along today. Um, and, and, but just how much money are we talking about, right? They say that about $300 million worth of gold and silver came out of the Comstock load in the 1860s and 70s. How much is that in modern terms? It's actually quite difficult to compare sums of money over large periods of time. You want to use the consumer price index as what we most normally use to compare prices, but that actually only works well over relatively short periods of time, like 20 years. You know, what, how does the get price of gas today compare to the price of gas 20 or 30 years ago? When you start taking it back over much larger periods of time, a century and a half, you lose that comparison because the price of commodities varies so widely. If we were alive in the 1860s, we'd be spending 50% of our income on food, right? Food was very expensive in the context of that time, and it's a trivial expense for most of us today. We could feed ourselves with 5 or 10% of our incomes rather than 50%, right? Uh, and, and most in many cases. Um, uh, equivalent labor values is another way you can compare wealth. Like, what did a guy earn for an unskilled labor or day's work in 1850 or 1860 compared to today? Well, an unskilled laborer, an Irishman digging a ditch in New York City in 1850, made about a dollar a day. Uh, and that same guy working 
simple construction in New York would probably make about 100 or $120 a day today, right? So that's one way of comparing wealth through time. Another way is to look at like, and this is about the emotional impact. This sort of measures the emotional impact of sums of money, which anybody that's married will recognize in an instant that money has an emotional impact, right? Um, uh, the, um, so take, take a sum of money and measure it against the total GDP of the United States economy at that time, and then measure it against the total GDP of the modern economy. In that context, uh, Three hundred million dollars in the 18, at the end of the 1870s would be equivalent to about 604 billion modern dollars. Okay, so now we are coming into Silicon Valley sums of money, right? That's like having the market cap of Apple buried a thousand feet below the dirt in Nevada, right? Uh, and then unleashing the energy of the American population on how to dig that out, right? All of us would start grabbing shovels if we thought there was that much money. A thousand feet down in Nevada, um, uh, and that is emotional impact, right? Um, and think of the concentration too. During that same period of time, in the uh, about five hundred million dollars came out of the California gold field. So also a massive sum of money. But the California gold field is two hundred and forty miles long and twenty to forty miles wide so it's fairly large and that that gold uh, that gold is diffused through the through the mother load right the comstock load is very different kind of mining it's load mining it's quartz mining where the 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 rock the country rock around the vein so uh, a load mine is created when you have a fault in the earth a fissure in the earth which hot circulating groundwater is deposit quartz with and mineralized quartz into that uh, and, but only the vein has any expectation of value, right? The, the rock on both sides, they call it the country rock, and mining is valueless, right? So, and these veins are small. You know, they can be 10 to a few hundred feet wide at most. Well, the Comstock load is two and a half miles long and a few hundred feet wide, and it had $300 million worth of gold and silver in it. Uh, so, it was spectacular. It, 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 exerted a massive influence on the United States at that time. Um, you know, Virginia City, Nevada, I'm, I guess most of us have at least visited the place. It's this town of about 852 people in the last census, perched on a mountainside in western Nevada with a view of the bleak desert and stuff. It seems like the back end of beyond, right? Um, and it's got a couple of really fun bars to go do some day drinking at and watch the people walking up and down the street. However, uh, that was the second biggest city in the West in the 1860s and 1870s, and it wasn't close. San Francisco was the biggest, and Virginia City was the second biggest. In the 1870s, it had about 25,000 people between Virginia City and Gold Hill. Los Angeles had a few thousand. Portland, Oregon had a few thousand. Sacramento had about half that population. Salt Lake City had about the same population, but they were pretty diffused into a, you know, an agricultural existence. Wasn't an industrial town at all, Salt Lake. Denver had a few thousand inhabitants. There was nothing in the West that rivaled Virginia City. It was the second city of the West and everybody knew it. When you came on a Western tour after the railroad was put in in 1869, Virginia City and San Francisco were the two places that you absolutely had to see. Um, so it exerted this massive influence on the development of the West. Um, and contrary, contrary to, um, to like myth, the West was not settled from east to west by this like slow plotting of the frontier, right? You had achieved, we had achieved, or American, United States society had achieved the Missouri River frontier by the end of the 1840s. And there was, you know, the high plains and the Rocky Mountains and the Nevada deserts or the Great Basin deserts all the way out there to these remote mountains in California. Well, the California gold discovery May, uh, you know, an almighty jump of settlement over to California and still nothing in the middle. The discovery of the Comstock load in 1859 made people realize that, hey, there's probably something out there in the Great Basin that we are neglecting. 
you know, and so all of the mining impetus, the mining frontier was settled from west to east as frustrated California miners generally moved through Virginia City and then fanned out over the Great Basin in the Intermountain West. So all these places, the mining towns in Idaho, uh, the Boise Basin, uh, Western Montana mining regions, Colorado, all the rest of Nevada, um, uh, New Mexico and Arizona, they were all, those were settled by Comstock miners and Comstock prospectors fanning out over the Great Basin looking for mineral wealth. And much of that region was settled from west to east rather than east to west. Um, and that is very much contrary to the sort of popular impression of how the west was settled. Well, uh, into this story, we've got my man John Mackey, who's the main character of this book. When I, I finished my last book, which was um, a World War II flying story, China's Wings, about this airline, William, uh, and the guy that had gone out to China to found this airline. Fascinating story. I got to meet a whole bunch of the pilots, uh, review all the old airline documents. Really a ton of fun to research and write that project with one crucifying problem. Every time I wanted to visit a location, it was on the far side of the Pacific, right? So I could only really afford to go once. And I went once early in the process. It was instrumental in getting me going and stuff. But it would have been nice to be able to go a couple more times and you know, there's just way too big of a geographic obstacle in the middle. So when it came time to find a new story, I'm like, there's gotta be something closer to home that's worth writing about. So I started ferreting around in the early history of San Francisco and kept running across all the connections to the Comstock load, which if you know how to look for them, are everywhere in San Francisco, starting with the cable car. Um, um, and you know, I had real fond memories. My mom had taken me over there when I was a little boy in the 70s. And, and so I started looking into it. I read all the books that had been written about the Comstock load, and there had been lots written. Uh, the, my two favorites were written in 1883 and 1876. So it seemed like there was a pretty big gap in there. Lots of stuff since. Everybody hit, the most writers, well, they fell into one of two camps, it seemed to me, either really dry and quite boring and not much of a story, or they'd really fallen in love with like the whiskey and the gun smoke and the hooker with the heart of gold story, which is a gigantic load of malarkey in the context of the West, right? And so I thought there was room to work in there with something new. Uh, and the more I looked into it, the better I felt the story would be. I, I really got fascinated with the engineering of it. Like, how did they do that? You sit out there in Virginia City today in the bucket of blood having a beer and you look out over that valley and there is, you see these massive tailings piles, you know, that they dug out of them. Well, they dug that stuff out by hand. Those mines were more than 3,000 feet deep in the 1880s. I was just staggered by the energy that it took to do that. And so I decided to kind of approach it as a working man's story or a working person's story. You know, people didn't, people came west to make money. It was the economic opportunity that drew so many people out here. And, and that was kind of my focus on it. And I, I was, got very interested in the engineering of the mines, perhaps too much. Most of the criticism around the books goes around a surfeit of detail and because uh, people have said that I'm trying to train them to be miners. Um, but I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, and all these things that had never seemed, uh, never, I had never like, wrapped my head around became very obvious why you would do things this way. Like it's way easier to mine uphill than it is downhill. That, that, it's sort of counterintuitive until you think about it, right? You want to have gravity help you drop things down rather than having to pick things up. Um, anyway, uh, and the, like the mine shafts and the massive mine engines that got built on them. And, and I, uh, when I, once I, my fascination had been cemented, you need a character to carry the story. And that story leads really quickly to John Mackey. He was the seminal figure in the history of the Comstock load. He walked onto the load in 1859, a few weeks after it was discovered, without a nickel to his name. He was absolutely flat broke, took a job in somebody else's mine for $4 a day, and worked stupendously hard, and worked his way up from nothing. And by the middle of the 1870s, he was arguably the richest person in the world. Um, and so it's this amazing rags to riches story. And Mac Mackey himself is like the ultimate American immigrant story. He had been born in a 
in a one-room cottage in Ireland with a dirt floor, no interior rooms, no windows, no chimney, right? They had a peat fire. Um, he shared the floor with his mother, father, sister, and the family pig, right? And, um, and they immigrated to New York in 1840 when he was nine, settled in the Five Points neighborhood, which is right around City Hall and, and like the foot of the Brooklyn Bridge in Lower Manhattan. Um, in the Five Points neighborhood, that's the Gangs of New York neighborhood, for you, those of you that have seen that movie. It was the most squalid and awful slum in the world in the 1840s. Totally famous as you know, a sink of iniquity. These you know, animalistic Irish immigrants were drunks and criminals and drug addicts, and they were lazy and bums. Um, and you know, we should have built a wall to keep them out because we didn't <laughs> want them. Uh, well, uh, Mackie, the Mackey family must have done pretty well for the first couple of years because Mackey went to school for two years and only about half of the uh, school age Irish children attended any school at all in New York. However, his dad died two years later, so he had to go to work at age 11 to support his mother and sister which he did selling newspapers as a, as a newsboy, a New York newsboy crying the headlines, and selling newspapers, making about 60 or 70 cents a day, uh, sweeping street crossings for tips, shining shoes, carrying packages, anything he could to make ends meet. Um, somebody must have recognized his work ethic and honesty and ability because he got an apprenticeship as a ship's carpenter, apprentice ship's carpenter late in the 1840s when he was 16. Um, and then a couple of years later, gold was discovered, right, out here. It's one of the seminal events of the 19th century in United States history, possibly second only to the, the Civil War uh, in terms of the influence that it has on modern America. Anyway, uh, Mackey did not come to California in 1849 or 1850. I, I presume because he was a man of his word and he had probably promised his labor to his employer for the term of his apprenticeship, which probably ran four or five years. He came to San Francisco in um, 1851, in the last half of 1851. And when he got off the boat, the first three things he would have recognized in San Francisco was, oh my God, it's stunningly expensive. <laughs> Um, it cost about a dollar a meal in San Francisco to get a, the, the cheapest meal in San Francisco cost a dollar at a time when a full day's wage in New York City for an unskilled adult male laborer was a dollar, right? So that would be the equivalent of $100 for a burrito in modern San Francisco, right? That's got to be the cheapest food in San Francisco. The cheapest meal is a burrito, right? So. Uh, um, the, uh, the second thing was that everybody was from somewhere else. You know, you could regularly hear eight languages spoken on a city block in San Francisco, much as it is today. And the third thing was that San Francisco was a wide open town. It was a very tolerant place. Uh, a standard piece of mining camp wisdom went that um, every person has the right to go to hell in the manner of their own choosing. Um, <laughs> and San Francisco still reflects that even today. Uh, all three of those things are every bit as true today as they were in 1851. Well, Mackey mined around Downeyville when Downeyville was a thriving town of about 3,000 people about 80 or 90 miles north of Sacramento, right? Currently has 242 residents, so it has also seen better times. Um, he, the placer mining, like I said, very different kind of mining than the mining that would be discovered on the Comstock load. It hasn't been discovered. That kind of mining hasn't been discovered yet. You know, it's gold flakes distributed through the riverbed sediments, and you wash that out. That's, that's a mining that a poor man can afford to do, right? Because each day's work pays a wage. You literally find gold from each day's worth of work, so you're paying yourself as you go along, right? In fact, miners talked about their claims as a good claim paid wages, and a bad claim didn't make grub, right? So you had to make enough gold to pay for your provisions or you were in a money losing proposition. But if you were getting a wage, you were making money over and above. Uh, and in the early 1850s, people did very well. It was not a good, most average mining returns for a hardworking guy were about an ounce of gold a day. That declined through the 1850s because those guys were very good at what they did. They got the gold out of the ground in a hurry. Um, 
by the end of the decade, Mackey and his partners around Downeyville were not making grub. They were not covering their costs. So when the Comstock load was discovered and when rumors went through the camps about this new kind of mining where they discovered silver and gold in this funny rock twin together, you know, it didn't take much encouragement for them to pull up stakes, there's a good mining term for you, and hike over the Sierras to this new location uh, in what would become called Virginia City. They were too poor to afford a mule, so they walked the 140 miles from Downeyville to, to, to Virginia City. Um, and went, like I said, Mackey went to work on somebody else's mine uh, for $4 a day. He started getting ahead in the world by doing a second shift of hard labor per day in exchange for feet. Now feet were how these claims were owned. If, if, because uh, California gold mining, it makes sense to have square or rectangular claims because you have an expectation that the gold might be diffused throughout the sediments there, right? That doesn't make sense in a quartz claim or a load claim where you have a line that has value, essentially a sheet hanging in the, in the ground uh, with country rock on both sides, but only the sheet has value. So you cut that sheet up into distinct slices of claims and they would be owned. Um, so let's say you had a 400 foot claim, like the Hale and Norcross claim on the Comstock load, that would have 400 feet in it. And originally, you, and you could buy and sell feet, you could trade the feet in your claim, and originally each foot pertained to a geographical foot, but that was a recipe for endless lawsuits. Miners are really awesome at suing each other, and it was bad enough as it is, but trying to divide up a mine into 400 little slices was a recipe for endless, endless lawsuits. So it quickly became a 1 400th share in the larger claim. And there's lots of attractive women in the audience today. If you gals were out here in the 1860s, you would not have entered into the affections of a man who wasn't at least a centipede or a millipede, right? You wanted a guy that owned thousands of feet because um, that was where the real wealth was in the 1860s, was in, was in owning feet. Uh, and Mackey would trade his labor on the second shift for feet. So a claim that had paying ore at the surface had a cash flow. They could pay their workers on a daily basis. If you didn't have ore at the surface, you didn't have a cash flow. And the only way you could pay somebody to work for you was in exchange for a slice of the ownership in the mine. So you would be paid in feet. Sweat equity, right, was paid in feet. So Mackey spent his first winter on the Comstock load digging an adit, a, a tunnel from further down slope to intersect the load to strike that sheet underground in, the and in exchange for feet. And so the owner is paying him for work in the hopes that a little bit of his claim will be enough to motivate Mackey to dig this thing. And Mackey's doing it in the hopes that these feet will they'll strike ore and then the value of the feet will soar, right? Because the value of feet rises and falls based on the expectation of future earnings, just like a stock price does. And since Mackey spent his whole life working underground, he generally had a pretty good idea of whether the indications in a mine were improving or getting worse, right? So he speculated in it, uh, pretty wisely in mining feet. In, uh, he would trade, buy and sell feet. And through the early 1860s, people quickly recognized his hard work and leadership ability, and he became like a gang boss and an underground foreman and a foreman and a uh, superintendent in fairly quick succession in the early 1860s. Um, and um, so he's working his way up in the world. At the same time, there is a new guy in Virginia City by the name of Sam Clemens, right? He's come west with his brother, uh, kind of avoiding service in the Civil War. His brother had been appointed secretary of the Nevada Territory, and so he came west as the unpaid secretary to the secretary of the Nevada Territory, and he was trying to get some mining wealth. He wanted to get rich mining. Sam Clemens was always obsessed with getting rich. Um, uh, he had claims around Unionville, which is in the Humboldt Mountains near Lovelock in modern Nevada, and also after those failed, he went to Aurora, which uh, used to be a booming mining camp, now doesn't exist. It's now an open pit mine on the California-Nevada border. And um, he owned in some ledges there, as they would call it. But happily for American literary destiny, none of his mines came in rich or anything close, right? 
and he penned letters to the Territorial Enterprise, which was the leading newspaper in Virginia City, the leading newspaper in uh, what had just become the Nevada Territory, and um, over the pen name Josh, right? Uh, presumably intended more as verb than noun, right? And the owner of the Territorial Enterprise recognized his literary talent and offered him a job at, um, at uh, $6 a day on the Territorial Enterprise. And, uh, Sam Clemens actually hemmed and hawed for some weeks about whether to take this job. You know, it was a secure paycheck, but there's no upside to being a writer, right? Uh, there is an upside to being a miner. You might strike it rich. Um, fortunately for American literary destiny, none of his ledges came in rich or anything close. So after this couple of weeks of soul searching, he surrendered himself to the dead sure thing and went to Virginia City. And a few, sometime later, he wrote his sister and said, they pay me $6 a day and I make 50% profit by only doing $3 worth of work. <laughs> um, now, in February of 1872, he, uh, his byline, Mark Twain, first appeared at the bottom of a story in the Territorial Enterprise. Um, he was a very successful writer. And when you read lots of his early journalism, a lot of it's not that interesting or not that entertaining. But almost every one of the stories has like a little nugget of ore in it where you're like, wow. And some of it is so good that it's actually kind of demoralizing to run across it as a writer, right? So they're like, wow, that guy's been getting paid for it for about eight months, and I've been doing it for 25 years, and I've never written a sentence that good. That's a common feeling when you read Mark Twain's early stories. Uh, the one that really stands out to me as super awesome is when he was describing in a, in a, in a mock letter to a, a person in, in Missouri who was inquiring about Western conditions. He says, you know, to this person back in Missouri, you can loan your umbrella out seven months of the year with the serene confidence that a Christian feels in four aces. <laughs> That's like the most brilliant sentence of all time, if you ask me. It's got like four twists in it. It's fabulous. Anyway, uh, Clemens and Mackey, Sam Clemens, Mark Twain, and John Mackey were friends. And uh, later in life, when they were two of the most famous Americans, uh, you know, Twain wrote a few pieces about Mackey and their times together on the Comstock load. Um, and they stayed together, they stayed friends their whole lives. They would hang out in the 1890s. And uh, uh, Mark Twain, Sam Clemens was always get, trying to get Mackey to invest in his strange like printing type machines and stuff like that. Uh, one of which eventually Twain went broke over, but Mackey never invested. <laughs> he, he could recognize a dead sure thing too, right? <laughs> or a bad one. Anyway, uh, so um, Mackey makes a small raise on a mine called the Kentuck, um, which is only 94 feet wide. It's not that small of a raise, actually. So in 1865, end of the Civil War, he consolidates all of his holdings and buys this one 94-foot slice of the Comstock load. It's the smallest mine on the load called the Kentuck. And it's actually over the hill in Gold Hill, if you know the terrain, where you start going down Gold Canyon. You have the Gold Hill Hotel there with that head frame of the mine right up behind it. That's the Kentuck. That sits right on it. Anyway, um, so it's very expensive, this kind of mining. And the shafts were down well over 200 feet at this time. Uh, and so it costs money to dig that far down. And Mackey doesn't have that much. So he borrows $20,000. Um, the only thing of any value that he owns is the stock of this mine, the feet, the 94 feet of this mine, which he has to pledge over as collateral to receive this loan that's going to allow him to dig this shaft. Now, the terms of the loans at, in the Pacific Coast at that time were 3% interest per month and a three-month term, right? So at the end of three months, if you're, the guy that was your creditor could call the loan, and if you couldn't pay back the $20,000, he could seize your collateral property, which in Mackey's case was the stock in this mine. Uh, so Mackey, for three months, digs down, gets down 250 feet, and he hasn't found a thing of value. He's found a lot of dirt, but no ore. Uh, and he's in a very vulnerable position when the mine next door makes a strike about 40 feet deeper than he currently is. And it seems likely that that ore body, it seems possible at least, that that ore body will span into the Kentuck mine, which would make its value way more than the $20,000 of the pledged property. Um, 
And so Maggie, it's the most vulnerable point in Maggie's career. He goes into a negotiation with James Phelan of the Phelan building there on Market Street, right? He'd made a good fortune as a mercantile operator in San Francisco in the 1850s. Phelan, and he slams his fist down on the table and says, Mr. Phelan, 3% interest per month is outrageous. That is usurious. I demand that you reduce the interest on this. And Phelan slams his fist down and says, young man, if you know what's good for you, you'll accept an extension at 3% and say nothing about the interest rate. And Mackie hems and haws, but of course that's exactly what he wants as an extension. And eventually, he was a good poker player, eventually he relented, signed the extension, and a few weeks later, they struck ore in the bottom of that mine shaft. And over the course of the next 18 months, he and his partner took $1.6 million worth of gold and silver out of that 94-foot slice of the Comstock load. Uh, they each made $600,000 of profit. Uh, his partner went east, uh, took his raise and went east. His, he had a brother touting spectacular opportunities in Eastern Railroad investments, promptly lost it all. Mackey, as most miners do, invested his raise. That's what you called it if you, raise, if you made a big strike, you made a raise in mining. So he invested his raise. He, he spread his over three different operations. One in southeastern Idaho, a mine called the Rising Star. That was a bust because it had tons of silver, but it was mixed up with base metals. So it was very hard to reduce to get the silver out of the ore. That was a loss. The bullion mine also on the Comstock load, um, right on the divide where that, where that gym is now. There's a gymnasium in Virginia City. That's where the bullion mine was. And then uh, the, both of those were unsuccessful. Uh, and however, the Bank of California had gained control of the Comstock, most of the productive mines of the Comstock load through very nefarious schemes where they ended up with the proxy voting control for the mines, but not owning the shares. Uh, they had loaned on mining stock collateral. Every time they did that, they insisted on receiving proxy votes for the shares that were the collateral. So they accumulated influence in mine management, which meant they could install superintendents who were loyal to them, who would then send ore to the mills that the three principal guys of the Bank of California, William Sharon, William Ralston, and Darius Ogden Mills, um, privately owned. So they would make money from milling the ore from the mines, and they were not above having their superintendents dilute pay ore with waste rock because mills earned money per ton of ore reduced. Mines earned money based on returns, right? So uh, that was pumping money from the public stockholders to the privately owned coffers of these three guys. Now, Darius Ogden Mills is the namesake of the town, of, well, actually of the Mills building in downtown San Francisco and Millbrae and Mills Field, which is SFO, right? And he was a thief of the first water. Um, anyway, the weakness in that scheme is that they did not actually own the stock, right? They owned the proxy voting control for that stock. Well, Mackey formed a secret partnership with another miner named James Fair and two San Francisco saloon keepers turned stockbrokers, all four of them Irishmen, James Flood and William O'Brien. That's James Flood of the Flood Building. And James Clare Flood currently has an office on the 11th floor of that building. He is the great, great grandson of James Clare Flood. Mackey's partner is a delightful old guy. Um, anyway, they... Um, they conducted a secret raid in 1868 and 1869. Flood was buying and selling lots of shares of the Hale and Norcross mine, a mine they had targeted as being not properly developed by the bank ring. And uh, before, nobody noticed that he was buying a lot more shares than he was selling. And when the next election for that mine came around, the Irishmen, the firm as they called themselves, had more than 50% of the stock. They ousted the bank ring management, installed themselves, and promptly made a big strike deeper in that mine, and that became hugely profitable. They invested the proceeds from that mine into a stretch of ground that is right in the middle of Virginia City. If you are standing at C Street and Sutton Avenue, right in the middle of town or Union Street, you are right above the Con Virginia mine, the consolidated Virginia mine that would become the richest you know, stretch of ground in the world. Um, 
and they invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in buying the ground and sinking and prospecting the shaft, but, but uh, 1,100 feet down, they just clipped the top of profitable ore uh, 1,100 feet below the streets of Virginia City, and they spent the next year and a half kind of sinking winzes. That's a vertical work going down inside a mine, drifting and cross-cutting, prospecting this strike, and then sinking another 100 feet and doing the same thing. And when they finally opened it on the 1500 foot level, they recognized that they had the, what became pretty famous, still is pretty famous in the mining world as the Big Bonanza. And it was, a, it was an ore body about 1,000 feet long, 600 feet deep, and up to 350 feet wide. And they took $110 million of gold and silver out of that one ore body in the last, 18, in the last four years of the 1870s. It absolutely firehosed them with money. The firm, which became known as the Bonanza firm after the big strike, um, had m larger expenditures and income per month than 50% of the states in the union. They had more revenues than whole countries did. They were staggeringly wealthy in the context of that time. And, um, and it, it made Mackey, who owned the lion's share of the partnership, the richest person in the world in terms of mon monthly uh, arguably the richest person in the world, and in terms of monthly cash flow, it wasn't even close. He had a, you know, like $450,000 a month of cash income. You know, don't forget that they're digging it up in cash. Gold and silver are monetized at this time. So they smelt, they reduce the ore, retort the, the amalgam down into bars of bullion, send those bars of gold and silver bullion to the mint, the mint refines them out into constituent metals, stamps it out into gold and silver coin, and gives it back, right? So they were literally digging up cash. And um, uh, Mackey didn't have much ambition with what to do with this money, other than that he wanted to become a rich and successful miner. He wanted to be the richest and most successful mine operator in the world, and all of a sudden he was. His wife, however, she knew exactly what to do with the money. Um, she has a very interesting story, every bit as amazing as John Mackey's. She had a first husband, a doctor, not anywhere near as prestigious an occupation in the 19th century as it is today. Uh, he was an alcoholic and got himself addicted to opium, which was the only medicine that actually worked. He was certainly abusive, uh, pro um, certainly an alcoholic and a drug addict, probably abusive to Louise. They had two daughters, one of whom died in infancy. The other daughter had been left in the doctor's care while Louise went out and he, he, she fell down the stairs and broke her pelvis. He leaves the Comstock load in disgrace. She supports the surviving daughter, her surviving daughter doing sewing, which was the lowest order woman's occupation or the lowest paid woman's occupation it was very complicated, plain sewing, as they call it. it There's like 27 stitches, but every woman knew how to do them. It was a common part of every woman's domestic education, which sort of kept wages pinned to the bottom hem. So she ekes out a living barely on the Comstock load for a couple years until Mackey and her fall in love and they get married around the time that Mackey has made this, his first raise from the Comstock load. So he was from the Kentuck mine. So he is a successful mine owner, but not the richest person in the world, right? Well, she goes through, they are married 10 years, they have two sons, or six or eight years. She is living in San Francisco because she hates the Comstock load. As soon as they make a substantial raise, he buys her a house at O'Farrell and Polk, right? So um, uh, it's not, it was a good part of town then, but not a great part of town because the, around the time the cable car gets invented and moves San Francisco's quality real estate to the top of Knob Hill. Um, but she, they take a European vacation in the middle 1870s and he buys for her instead of someplace on top of Knob Hill, he buys nine Rue de Tilsit in Paris. Now, if you've ever stood on the Arc de Triomphe and looked out over the Place de l'Etoile, one of those first mansions that you see, well, that, the outermost road is Rue de Tilsit. Nine Rue de Tilsit is one of the houses, the mansions that faces the Arc de Triomphe, the Place de l'Etoile. It's currently the Belgian embassy. So it's quite literally the best address in Paris. She sets up there, Mackie puts $10 million in bonds on deposit for her in Europe. 
and she has this astonishing monthly income. There are European countries that don't have as much cash income per month as Louise Mackey. If you go to the Boucheron website, that's the famous Parisian jeweler, they still list Louise Mackey as the best customer they've ever had. Um, she starts throwing these salons and becomes great friends with all these European aristocracy. And, and there, she, she could speak French and Spanish because her mother was from New Orleans. So she, although grew up poor, she grew up in Downeyville too, um, is, is a refined person with good manners and good taste. And, and Mackey, while he's taken out the big bonanza, right, he can't really leave Virginia City that much. You have the richest thing in the world. Getting this out of the ground is a massive engineering challenge. I mean, think of the size of this thing. How do you extract a void that large from that far underground without it collapsing in on itself, right? A tremendous engineering challenge that Mackey wasn't willing to trust to other eyes or other supervisory hands. So he's stuck there most of the time. Uh, once a year, he would take the train to New York. It was only eight days on the train to New York, and then another 14 days across the Atlantic to Europe and spend a month or two with his sons and then come back. And by the time he had this thing out of the ground in 1879 and 1880, he kind of switched. So he'd spend about two months a year in um, Nevada and the West tending his business interests, and then nine months a year in Europe traveling around with his sons and his wife. And, you know, they toured all the European capitals. He loved the theater and music. He had been a newsboy in New York. There were sort of famous enthusiastics of low, enthusiasts of low theatrical entertainments in New York, like elbowing for seats in the galleries of the Bowery Theater and stuff like that. And um, uh, well, as his, he had loved the theater companies that would tour the West, he became a huge patron of the great Shakespearean actors of the 19th century, John McCullough, uh, Edwin Booth, John Wilkes's brother, and um, uh, patron of the arts, um, uh, Alexandre Cabanal, um, Jean Bonnat, uh, Ernst Mezunet, the great sort of mid-century French artists were all patronized by the Mackeys, uh, uh, the, the great music companies, all this stuff, they saw it all. And then in 1883, um, the Russian Tsar got, there was a coronation for the Russian Tsar, I believe it's Nicholas III. His father had been assassinated by the Nihilists in 1881. He actually didn't want to get crowned because it was a, such a big public ceremony, he was feared that he'd be a target. But, you know, the Russians have a saying that a, a king was only half a Tsar until he'd been crowned, right? So he's got this tremendous political pressure to host the coronation ceremony, and everybody's sending ambassadors there. Well. Uh, the President of the United States asked John and Louise Mackey to go to U Moscow as special ambassadors of the United States to the coronation of the Russian Tsar, which was the most splendidly barbaric aristocratic ceremony in Europe in the middle 19th century. Only Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee was more outrageous. And, and so there's Mackey and, and John and Louise Mackey, and he had been born in a, in a on a dirt floor in Ireland, right? And here he is rubbing shoulders with kings and queens in Moscow at this incredible ceremony, totally holding his own and the, you know, and the, the, everybody knew about them. Their story was the most famous one in the world, right? That, that they had been come from nothing and were now the richest people in the world, right? It was the ultimate American immigrant story, the only in America story, right? And it was front page news all over the world. And, at the coronation ball, the Tsarina singled out John Mackey and like asked him questions about California and Nevada. And, and the Tsar, the new Tsar, said that Louise Mackey was the best dressed woman at the ball, right? Um, so this tremendous social triumph. Um, Mackey doesn't, after that uh, incredible rags to riches story, he, he, he decides that he's too young to retire. He gets, um, He's become aware of the transatlantic telegraph monopoly owned by Jay Gould. He fights this, he lays two rival telegraph cables up across the Atlantic. He's one of the few people in the world that could actually afford to build the things. And there's this five year rate war with Gould, who is the most hated businessman of the age, that Mackey ends up winning. The rates of transatlantic telegraph traffic fell by half. Mackey's interests become in telecommunications in 
the very first digital communications technology, right? It's the, it's the absolute uh, uh, ancestor of the, you know, the arterial ganglia of the modern World Wide Web. It just sends a few hundred signals per minute instead of a few hundred million per second, right? Um, uh, and when he died in 1902, John Mackey was one of the most celebrated Americans. It's almost impossible to find bad press about Mackey after 1880. And he's almost entirely forgotten today. When, when he died, the headline on the San Francisco Chronicle, John Mackey dead, is about the same size as the Black Banner headline that announces the attack on Pearl Harbor 40 years later, right? Um, but Mackey is almost forgotten for the very ironic reason that he was basically a good guy. He, he never chiseled on his employees' wages. He had come up as a wage earner. He never pushed his employees' wages down. He did what he could to keep working conditions safe and good. Uh, he's one of the first businessmen that encouraged employees into stock purchasing programs for the company stock. Um, very forward thinking and much beloved figure. And, and he, he was extraordinarily charitable in his lifetime, both he and Louise. They gave away immense sums, almost always anonymously. You know, the, the opera here in San Francisco, the first big donation, anonymous. That's John and Louise Mackey. The Metropolitan Opera in New York, Maurice Grau's Opera Company, the one that is still there today, anonymous. That's John and Louise Mackey. Uh, hospitals, the San Sacramento Cathedral they built for Bishop Patrick Minogue, the first Bishop of the Archdiocese of Sacramento. He had been the priest on the Comstock load who had been much comfort to Louise during her years of straitened circumstances. Um, the list goes on and on. But they felt no pressure to found an eponymous university or philanthropic organization like people like Leland Stanford, Collis Huntington, John Rockefeller, Carnegie, Mellon. Those guys were among the most reviled Americans in the 1890s, and rightly so. Uh, you want to read about an evil capitalist, read about Andrew Carnegie's strike-breaking efforts, right? Um, and uh, Mackey had none of that. And uh, those other guys founded those institutions and they spent a hundred years rehabilitating the family name and it worked. Those guys are remembered fondly for their philanthropic works and Mackey is largely forgotten. Anyway, I hoped that my book, which is kind of a half biography of John Mackey and half a biography of the Comstock load would kind of rehabilitate the reputations of both men into the national fabric. Um, and that's a quick summary of the story and I, Happy to entertain anybody's questions that you guys might have about the Bonanza King. How does the uh, railroad impact their, uh, their life and operations? Was it coming in or something? The railroad, so the Comstock load is discovered. What impact, the question is, what impact did the railroad have on Mackey and the Comstock load and I would suppose the Nevada mining world? Well. Um, for the first 10 years, it didn't exist. So the load is discovered in 1859. The, the railroad reaches over the Sierras and reaches what was then the Truckee Meadows in 1868. And the, Mr. Lake, who owned Lake's Crossing on the Truckee River in the surrounding ranch, platted out a town site, called it Reno in honor of a fallen uh, Union officer who was killed in a battle in the Civil War and sold the town lots in 1868. So Virginia City was 10 years older than Reno when Reno was started. Um, they built a railroad from Virginia City to Reno. That's the Virginia and Truckee Railroad via Carson City. Um, and it, it was hugely revolutionary on everybody's lives. It dropped the prices of everything, which in the Comstock load was very beneficial. In the California economy, the railroad brought depression, right? Because California industry had been very insulated from East Coast manufactured products because of the immense transportation cost, right? You had to send it on a boat around Cape Horn or across uh, the Panamanian Isthmus or Nicaragua or come across on a stagecoach. All of this was tremendously expensive. The price of that collapsed. The transportation costs collapsed with the railroad and California economy couldn't compete with foreign manufacturers from the eastern states. So there was a big depression in the California economy uh, from the connection of the railroad.
That's correct. That is the legacy. Uh, uh, what is the legacy of Mackey? It, it's the Mackey School of Mines at the University of Nevada, Reno. That was endowed by Mackey's son, Clarence, in 1908, ten, or you know, six years after Mackey died. Uh, but yeah, that, that is one of the world's foremost mining institutions. And it's got that great Guts and Borglund statue of Mackey out front. Um, okay, Mackey was very hardworking, but was he also lucky in finding the mines that produced? Well, yes, he was both hardworking, very knowledgeable, and also very lucky. Um, uh, it would have been a combination of all things that brought Mackey success. Um, you couldn't just like kick over a boulder and you know stake out a claim and hope that that would produce, right? You had to. In, it took a great knowledge of the mining industry and also great knowledge of the Comstock load as to what portions of it were most likely to produce. And and you don't know that for sure in mining. Now, Mac, one of Mackey's great sayings was people would always ask him, like, where should he invest? How do you how do you make money mining? And Mackey would say that he could never see further into a mine than the point of the pick, right? So you had to get down there and dig it out to find out. Um, it was he was very lucky in a couple cases, but it was it was directed luck, right? Um, and when they when they found the big bonanza, they just clipped the top of that ore body. They were only about forty feet below what was called the cap rock of that ore body. And if they'd have been forty feet closer to the surface, they'd have missed it entirely, and they'd probably still be down there. But they they weren't. They clipped it, and then. Uh, it was in a place they didn't expect, leading them in an unexpected direction, and um, and the development of that strike, you know. Uh, so it was a com luck was involved, but it certainly wasn't dumb luck by any stretch of the imagination. Um, did Mackey fund any organization in Ireland? Um, that's a good question. He visited Ireland on their first European trip to see if he could find anybody from his youth that he had given him a, and the family a kindness that he might return from his store of current good fortune. Um, but in the intervening 30 years, right, Ireland has suffered the potato famine and massive calamity. The population of Ireland has fallen by about 50% in that time frame. And Mackey went there and he couldn't find anybody that he could remember. Uh, so he didn't, he wasn't, he was kind of devastated by the situation of Ireland when he made that visit, but I don't, to the best of my knowledge, he didn't do any big philanthropies there. Uh, the next question is, ah, this is a good one. Are there living relatives of John Mackey? And if so, who and where are they living and what happened to his fortune? That's a lot of questions. Okay, John Mackey's son, Clarence, took, oh, he had two sons, John William Jr. and Clarence, John William Jr. was killed in a horseback riding accident in 1895, which is like the Mackey never recovered. That son was the apple of his eye. Um, Clarence inherited the family business when Mackey died in 1902, laid the Trans-Pacific Cable, finished the Trans-Pacific Cable uh, to the America's new colonial possessions in Hawaii and the Philippines that um, Mackey was working towards when he died. Uh, nursed the family business in the commercial cable company and the postal telegraph company through the aughts, teens, and 20s with some success. Consolidated all, sold in a stock maneuver, sort of sold Mackey Communications to uh, a company, a, a holding company, or a sh an international conglomerate called ITT for about $150 a share in 1928. You probably felt great about that deal when it went up to about $450 a share in 1929. Not so good about that deal by 1932 when it was about $2 a share. Um, that broke the family fortune by and large. Um, and only after I'd finished the book and it had been published did I get a phone call from a guy who was the CEO of Mackey Communications. IT&T, which is a very odd and evil middle, 19th, middle 20th century company that had interests on both sides of the Second World War and is implicated in two or three South American coups and all kinds of horrible stuff. In the early 60s, they sold a division, they sold Mackey Communications off to some private owners who still own it. Mackey Communications is a very successful business now. 
And all the merchant ships around the world, they supply the electronics gear that goes on the bridges of those. They have offices in like 12 countries and it's a multi-hundred million dollar a year business. Mackey's, great, gr Mackey's granddaughter, Ellen Berlin, Claren or Ellen Mackey, Clarence's daughter, married Irving Berlin, the great songwriter. So all of those fabulous Irving Berlin love songs, Blue Skies, those are all written about Ellen Mackey, and I would guess Ellen Mackey's blue eyes. They had a fabulously successful marriage, the two of them, and she also exerted a really amazing influence on a, a magazine that was founded in the middle 1920s called The New Yorker. She wrote the very, one of the, she wrote the story that established the first person informal voice of the New Yorker. So you know how when you read a New Yorker nonfiction story, the writer is always a part of the story, right? Uh, that's first person informal, and that comes from Ellen, Ber Ellen Berlin, Ellen Mackey. Um, I was, are they still living? Well, I, after the book had published, I went back to New York to actually meet my editors at Scribner. Who, you know, you don't meet people anymore in publishing, right? It's all email and telephone. But I, uh, my wife had an art opening on the East Coast, and we happened to be there. And so I've had lunch with my editor, which was a great day in life, right? Getting the red carpet treatment at Simon & Schuster was a good day in a writer's life. And then I, after that, I went down to Lower Manhattan to the Postal Telegraph Building, which Mackie built. It's right across the street from City Hall. It's the first building in the world that ever had an electric push-button elevator, right? Um, and I read a newspaper article that said that Mackie could see the site of the house he grew up in from an, his office on like the sixth or seventh floor of the southeast corner of that building. And I thought, I. Uh, knew that he'd grown up on Frankfurt Street. It's actually one of the, th it's one of its dumb details that's what led me to write this book because several other books mentioned him being, growing up on Franklin Street, which is right in the hearts of Five Points. But you can't see Franklin Street from the southeast corner of the Postal Telegraph Building. I'm looking at maps and I'm, maybe you could see just a tiny bit of the end of it. I just couldn't convince myself that Mackey had put his office there instead of on the other side of the building if he wanted to see the side of the house he grew up in. So that made me actually check the source, and it's a, it, it was one of those things that tends to perpetrate itself in book writing, where one person writes it and everybody else cites that book without actually looking at the original source. Well, the original source is Frankfort Street, not Franklin Street. Frankfort Street is the south side of the Brooklyn Bridge in, where it comes down into uh, Manhattan Island. The buildings on the north side were destroyed to make the footing of the bridge and the southeast corner of the Postal Telegraph building looks right down Frankfurt Street. You can see the whole thing from there. So I had gone to that site, to what I thought was the site of Mackey's house, to just to, to take a picture looking back at the Postal Telegraph building to prove to myself that I was right. Dang it. <laughs> and and um, as I'm standing there on the spot, I got an email from Ellen Berlin's granddaughter, so Mackie's great, great granddaughter and her husband who lived down in Palos Verdes in Los Angeles. So that was pretty cool and we corresponded a bunch and they, they were, the book was, had only been out like two weeks at that point. They'd already bought like 10 copies for everybody that they knew apparently. And, um, and what happened to his fortune? I guess I've talked about that one, okay. Was Mackie ever interested in politics? Uh, thinking of William Sharon, uh, Stewart, and Ralston, all of whom were politically motivated. Mackey never, he, he denied, he could have, if he just said, I want to be the senator from Nevada, he'd have won three elections, right? It was his for the taking, but he always said, I am not fool enough to go into politics. <laughs> he, however, was a very staunch backer of Ulysses S. Grant. When Grant took his around the world tour, that tour was financed by dividends from the Consolidated Virginia Mine. And I suspected that Mackey had probably put those shares in his hands. Um, so Mackey did have a certain amount of political influence, and he and Grant were very much kindred spirits. Uh, Mackey considered the greatest compliment he ever got. The two greatest compliments both came from Grant's mouth. At the, at the end of Grant's Around the World tour, he landed in San Francisco and visited Virginia City, and Mackey took him on a tour of the Bonanza Mines, uh, and Grant said it was one of the most impressive things he'd seen anywhere in the world, and that 
uh, Mr. Mackey, if he had decided to be a military man, would have made a great general. Uh, and Grant was never one to be very effusive with praise, so that Mackey thought was the great compliment he ever received. You were, okay, here's the question. You write about varied topics. How do you select them? What is my next topic? What is my next topic? I don't know. I am ferreting around in a lot of old stories trying to fall in love with one. It's, it's very important to fall in love with a story. Or you just, takes four, this took four years to write. China's Wings took eight years to write. Uh, if you don't really fall in love with your story, it's pretty hard to sustain the, the oomph, you know, to, uh, to get the bile up every morning to face the blank page, which is plenty hard enough as it is. Um, so I'm, I'm looking around for good stories that maybe haven't been told right or uh, and, and trying to find one. So if anybody knows any good ones, don't hesitate to let me know, please. Writers hate writing proposals, right? And that's where I'm at right now. So anything to short circuit that process. What kind of tax revenue for the federal government did the Comstock load provide? Um, the answer to that is zero, right? There was uh, not a business tax back then. And it provided a lot of money for the Nevada tax rolls and the county tax rolls and stuff. And there were all kinds of litigations over that, but I'm pretty sure it didn't provide any federal government tax revenue at all. Um, that said, the Comstock load itself did much to prop up the union economy and the, the Western mining wealth did much to prop up the union economy during the Civil War. Um, not so much in terms of money poured into the federal coffers, but in confidence created in the sustainability of the Northern economy, right? The federal government issues greenbacks, you know, money to, like today, a fiat currency unbacked by gold and silver, which was kind of a revolutionary idea in the context of the middle 18th century, or the middle 19th century. Um, and, you know, money is about confidence, right? You have confidence in its value. It doesn't actually, the, the dollar bill in your pocket doesn't actually do anything. It's not worth anything, and neither is gold. It's a fairly useless substance. It's that we confide value in it. That's what gives it value. So maintaining confidence, this, these shipments of Western gold and silver arriving in Eastern banks does much to buttress Northern confidence during the Civil War. So it does make a contribution to the national economy. And, and by the way, with, um, once we get off of the greenbacks and back onto hard currency, gold and silver currency, Western mining wealth is the only way that expands the money supply of the United States. You can't, that's why the gold standard is a terrible idea. You can't actually expand the money supply to expand with your growing economy. It's almost impossible for that to keep pace or is impossible to keep pace. So, um, so Western mining wealth is expanding the money supply, which means there's more money to loan and the, it generates more economic activity. So it contributed a lot to the growth of the American economy in the last decades of the 19th century. Okay, I haven't mentioned the near complete clear cutting of the Tahoe Basin to provide wood for the mine timbers and fuel for the... Uh, that is totally true. I mean, the, the, the environmental legacy of 19th century mining is colossal, right? I was wandering around the Dutch flat hydraulic mine on Tuesday driving back from Reno just to go look at it. That's just one example of like uh, massive environmental damage inflicted to get gold and silver out of the ground. You'd be hard pressed to find a tree in the Tahoe Basin older than 1860 because the whole thing was clear cut and those timbers went down the Comstock mines. Um, massive environmental impact in the 19th century from mining. Uh, mercury and the tailings from which they used the milling processes, huge impacts. However, during the context of their own times, it wasn't seen that way. Mining was actually seen as the cleanest wealth because you didn't make your money uh, by making profit off of one of your fellow citizens, right? It, you dug that wealth up from where God in his infinite wisdom had put it, right? You won it in fair fight with Mother Nature, and it was seen as real clean wealth. Um, and of course, they weren't conscious of the environmental legacy and the environmental damage that they were doing. Um, uh, that's our perspective of them. In the perspective of their own times, it was seen as, as quite a clean way of making a living, 
and what a guy like Jay Gould did, which was you know all kinds of financial dark chicanery with corporate paper and bonds and you know court cases. That was dirty wealth, right? Um, so. So whereas we tend to admire like Wall Street buccaneers and stuff, those were the reviled capitalists of the 19th century. And a guy that had made his money mining was seen as owning cleaner wealth. Uh, was the Sutro uh, Tunnel ever a success? Well, the Sutro Tunnel was completed. Uh, the question is, was the Sutro Tunnel ever a success? That's a huge drainage tunnel and at it in mining parlance that was dug from the Carson River uh, 20,400 feet, so five, four miles to intersect the Comstock load to drain the mines. Well, uh, when Sutro intersected the load, the mines were already a thousand feet deeper than uh, where his adit intersected them, and so it was a huge failure. Uh, Sutro knew that, sold his tunnel stock as soon as it intersected, invested in San Francisco real estate, and made a killing. Uh, in San Francisco real estate, all of the outer Richmond and inner Richmond between Laurel Heights and Land's End, that's a Sutro land development out there. Um, so, uh, you know, the, yeah, don't invest in mines uh, <laughs> unless you are a miner yourself. Thank you, Greg, very much. My pleasure.